try this as conference well. will now be recorded. And some of these are national rarities. So let's get going. First of all, a little montage of uh, some of our rare butterflies. Just to whet your appetite, we're going to cover most of these and I'll go through in more detail in due course. So there we have a number of fritillaries and a few others that we'll be looking at. Um, one or two more. And just in case you don't know where we are, most of us are in the sort of southern part of Cumbria, although welcome to all those throughout Cumbria and beyond. Um, you'll notice that on this map, uh, this is a little uh, map showing you the variety of species in the UK. And the south does have a greater variety than the north, as you can see from the red dots compared with the, the purple and the blue in Scotland. But around South Cumbria, and in particular in the Morecambe Bay area, you'll see uh, orange and even a red dot, uh, which is astonishing really, because uh, the Morecambe Bay area has uh, nearly 40 species of butterfly out of a total national count of 59. Uh, and that makes it a really wonderful area for butterflies. Uh, and in particular, um, we, we are home to a number of, uh, of rarities that are only found actually in, in Morecambe Bay and one or two other parts of the UK. So these again are some of the butterflies we'll be concentrating on. I'll just run through from top left, going clockwise. Um, we have the, the northern brown argus in the top left, um, not to be confused with the brown argus, which is very similar. Um, then we have um, the high brown fritillary, which is the UK's rarest butterfly. Uh, the dark green, uh, the dark green fritillary, the mountain ringlet. And then just below that, the pearl bordered fritillary, the Duke of Burgundy, which is not a fritillary. It actually belongs to a different family altogether, but looks like a small fritillary. And then bottom center, the small pearl, which is very similar to the pearl. Um, bottom left, we've got the uh, wall brown with its wings shut, uh, then the large heath. So we'll certainly be looking at these and a few other special butterflies shortly. Uh, and just a few more. There's the small pearl again. The small heath is not so rare in Cumbria, although in other parts of the UK it has become uh, more rare. And the dingy skipper, if we have time, you might mention that briefly too. Now, uh, butterflies like particular habitats. They're quite fussy, especially the rarer ones. So some species like taller, ranker grasses, these tend to be commoner butterflies. And so we won't say much about the ones on your screen now. Um, where the grass is very damp, again, we get a different assemblage of butterflies, the ringlet on your left. The center is the, uh, the small pearl, which is quite a rare butterfly. And they're very happy in quite damp areas. Um, orange tips, again, are quite common, uh, as are green veined white. On, on limestone grassland, and of course, Cumbria, one of the reasons why butterflies do so well here is we have such a mix of geology. And there's a, a limestone ring, as I'm sure many of you know, all around the center of the lakes. And limestones give calcareous soil. The soils are often very thin, very poor. Uh, often lacking in nutrient, and that's good for a, a, an assemblage of wildflowers, especially short turf. And in short turf, wildflowers can flourish uh, and butterflies can take advantage of that. So again, we have butterflies here that like uh, limestone and chalk grassland. Uh, then on upland heath, particular species favor those sorts of habitat, including top left, you can see uh, the uh, dark green fertility is one that we will be looking at shortly. And on our lowland bogs, both in uh, South Cumbria, in places like Methot Moss, Foulshaw Moss, uh, Nichols Moss, all Cumbria Wildlife Trust nature reserves. And I know many of you have been to these wonderful nature reserves, but also on mosses in the north of Cumbria, um, such as Drumborough Moss, Glasson Moss, Wedham Flow, uh, you'll find the large heath. And there's the large heath perched on some cotton grass. It's a caterpillar food plant. And then brownfield sites, sometimes overlooked, sometimes uh, ignored or rejected as 
unsuitable. They can also actually be very good for certain butterflies. Uh, in particular, northern brown argus, uh, dingy skippers, green hair streaks, uh, the grayling, uh, and the wall brown. And uh, these can actually really uh, enjoy uh, some of the plants that are found in, in brownfield sites, especially nearer to the coast. In Cumbria, we have a lot of brownfield sites all the way around from, uh, from Grange and uh, through Millam, Hodbarrow, uh, up along the coast up towards Bees, uh, Whitehaven, Workington, Maryport. There are a lot of excellent brownfield sites that are coastal sites for historic uh, and industrial archaeological reasons. And then our broadleaved woodlands. Again, we're fortunate in Cumbria having so many different habitats, and that's why we have such a, a great variety of butterflies. But um, holly blue and speckled wood, uh, white letter hair streak is uh, quite a localized and fairly rare butterfly these days um, and the purple hair streak um, the comma uh, used to be rare in cumbria and is now relatively common it's one of those species that's done quite well over the last few years so it, it very much depends on the habitat it depends on how the habitat is being managed or not being managed as the case may be uh, in woodlands again we have a lot of uh, lovely broadleaf woodlands. Some are managed, some are less managed, but fritillary butterflies like uh, woodlands or adjacent to woodlands, especially if the woodlands are well managed with uh, plenty of light and violet. Uh, most of our fritillary butterflies feed on violet. Now, uh, just looking at the general picture, you'll see that um, from this graph, wider countryside species, the commoner species that we looked at two weeks ago, uh, they've tended to do better than our habitat specialists. So since 1976, some of you will remember that really, really hot summer that we had back in those days. Uh, you'll see that habitat specialists really plunged right down to the 1980s. And although uh, there hasn't been a massive fall off since, we, we have had uh, a real struggle to, to turn the fortune of habitat specialists around. Wider species um, in the main didn't experience such a rapid plunge. So habitat specialists, they're, they're fussier. They often only feed on one or two food plants. That, that's their caterpillars, are very particular. Um, if other food plants are available, they'll reject them. They'd rather die than feed on something else that uh, they're not happy with. Often microclimate can be very, very important to them. Um, abundance of the host food plant is also important, as well as its absence or presence. Um, they're very colonial. Often they have less mobility than the more generalist species, like peacocks and tortoiseshells that will fly over big distances. Uh, even quite powerful fritillaries will often stay within one or two kilometers of where they were born, and sometimes a lot less. Um, because of that, their, their habitats are under threat, and they become fragmented. And obviously, with fragmented sites, uh, that can also lead to genetic problems uh, of inbreeding, where populations are not mixing from one site to another. So just to sum this part up, they're under threat from obviously predation and parasitism and disease, but we mentioned genetic problems. Pollution is an issue, a growing issue, um, with, for example, more nitrates uh, being deposited on fields, more nitrogen in the air. Uh, nitrogen, excess nitrogen can lead to excessive grass growth. Uh, excessive grass growth can swamp out some of the finer wildflowers that we were mentioning earlier. And of course, climate change is a big factor. Uh, we know, for example, that our winters are milder and wetter than they used to be, that weather is becoming more extreme. I mean, just take this year, the fact that we had such an incredible April and May, and then certainly in the North and Northwest, uh, June and July and much of August uh, have been really not very summery. So our summer this year was much more a spring event. But all these factors can uh, impinge upon the success of a colony of specialist butterflies. 
So let's focus a little bit more on individual species now, uh, and in particular our fritillary butterflies. Uh, you'll see this is um, quite a handy little table to help identify which is which, because if if you're seeing a pearl bordered butterfly in April or early May, it's almost certainly not a small pearl, and it is a pearl bordered, and that in itself can be a major, major recognition, a major, major identification factor for you, because pearl bordered, certainly these last few years, have emerged very early. Um, we actually had some emerging uh, in, in, in early April, which is almost unheard of, because the graph actually is based on national data, and you would expect pearl border to emerge in southern England earlier than in, in, in the north. But uh, recently, we've had such mild winters, and then this year, such a, a warm April and May that they emerged very, very early, much earlier than the small pearl. So the small pearls you'll see tend to emerge more in May, often late May or even early June, and their flight period will continue right through June and into July. It's very, very rare to find pearl borders um, beyond, say, the second week of June, whereas small pearls are happy to go right through June and into July. Um, of the larger fritillaries, the three there are the high brown, dark green, and silver washed. Um, usually the high brown and the dark green emerge around about the same time in late June. Uh, this year, again, it was early. Um, it was more like mid-June. And they both will fly throughout um, July and into August. Sometimes, if we have a little bit of an Indian summer, right up to the end of August. Uh, silver washed in this part of the world usually emerge a little later. Again, this table here in front of you is a national picture. But in the northwest, our silver wash fritillaries usually don't emerge until the end of June, more likely the early part of July. So they're usually at least a week, perhaps two weeks uh, later than the dark green and the high brown. Uh, so that sort of data can help you work out which butterfly is which, because obviously some of the fritillaries do look uh, similar. Um, the high brown and the pearl bordered uh, really do rely very heavily on our managed woodlands up in the northwest. And of course, since really the 60s and 70s, and especially right through the 80s and 90s, it became very uneconomical to manage woodlands in the more traditional way of coppicing, for example, hazel wood. Um, now, coppicing of hazel had been a terrific benefit to especially the pearl and the high brown. And as coppicing became less and less, so the pearl and the high brown have, have suffered as a consequence. Uh, the small pearl and the dark green, much, much less so. Um, they're less niche, they're less specialist, they're more adaptable, uh, a little bit more Catholic in their willingness to accept other food plants and other habitats. So they've tended to do better. Um, Certainly, we did benefit from some funding from the Morecambe Bay Limestones Woodland Project. Um, Butterfly Conservation uh, put in a claim for funding from a number of organizations uh, now about 10, 15 years ago. And we were lucky enough <clears throat> to be given money for contractors to, to come in and help manage some of these woodlands and to reinstitute uh, coppicing. Also, the Cumbria Wildlife Trust are fantastic at managing some of these sites for butterflies. So, for example, many of you will know Cow Ridding on the edge of Whitbarrow. And there, <clears throat> Joe Murphy and his team manage it on a rotational basis. Um, it's a checkerboard pattern, a bit like a, a chessboard. And blocks or coops are cut freshly each year on a rotation. It's about a 12 to 14 year rotation. Um, this is perfect for both the high brown and the pearl bordered because they uh, they love exposed areas of woodland where violets can flush through, where you get a lovely covering of young fresh violet coming through from the seed bank that's been uh, been there in the soil. 
so they particularly like those clearings in, in managed woodlands. Um, but just focusing on the pearl bordered, you'll see uh, the, the picture is not good. There's been a steady decline in, uh, in its distribution and in its abundance. We have lost a lot of colonies. For example, Hutton Roof um, in the late 90s had 12 separate colonies of pearl bordered. And by the year 2004, 2006, possibly, um, all had gone. Uh, there wasn't a single colony left on Hutton Roof. And I'm not actually aware of any pearl bordered fritillary colonies now uh, to the east of the M6 motorway. Um, so that's uh, a great shame. Um, similarly, they've been lost from Arnside Knot, which used to be a stronghold. Uh, there are many books, many relatively recent textbooks that mention the pearl borders of Arnside Knot. Uh, they, they finally reached their demise around about the year 2004, 2005. Um, so the early 2000s was really a, a, a bad time for the pearl bordered. But it's a beautiful butterfly. You'll see um, here we have a mating pair. If we look at the top one, you'll notice that distinctive silver patch in the center of its hind wing. So this is the underside, it's closed its wings. It has a ring of seven pearls around the edge and then a very distinctive silver white pearl right in the center. Now I'm stressing that because that's one of the key distinguishing features of the pearl bordered. The small pearl also has a ring of silver pearls, as we'll see shortly, but it has more than that one prominent white silver patch in the center. So there again is, is the prominent silver patch in the center. It's feeding on bugle. So bugle comes out around about May time. It's one of its favorite nectar sources. When I say feeding, of course, it's taking nectar. The caterpillars exclusively feed on dog violet, common dog violet. There again, uh, this shows that lovely central silver white patch right in the center, along with the seven pearls. There are some other lighter patches, and you'll see another whitish bright patch quite near to the body. But the key feature is that a large central white silver patch. So there it is with its wings open. Again, you can see it's May time on Bluebell. They, they will nectar on, uh, on Bluebell. This must be a fairly open Bluebell wood because they do like a fair bit of light. Some Bluebell woods would be a little bit too shady. If we look at the um, top, the red line, this is the small pearl. And you see they have held up reasonably well. They did very well in 2011. Um, obviously slipped back, but um, if we look at the blue line, I'm afraid the the story for the pearl is is a concern. However, there is some good news. You'll see the graph ends in 2016, but in fact, um, pearls have done quite well in the last two years. Now, two years, it's too soon to say that there's we've really turned the corner. But um, it is encouraging to see that if that graph were to go right up to 2020, uh, there would be uh, an appreciable upturn for the last two years. So there's the dog violet. <coughs> it's quite widespread. Although having said that, one of the reasons why fritillaries have struggled a little is that there is less dog violet now than there used to be. Uh, the dog violet's very happy to be here, but Unfortunately, um, it does get outcompeted by ranker grasses. And again, we come back to climate change and to these long, wet, mild winters where grass pretty much grows throughout the year. And uh, even in the winter, you know, there's grass growth uh, crushing out the, uh, the dog violets. So here's a distribution of pearl bordered. You see, really, um, Apart from South Cumbria, there's one dot in 
in the North Yorkshire Moors, um, quite near to Kirby Moorside, if you know that area. The next nearest is the Maybe Forest in Dumfries. And then we've got to go up to Northern Scotland, which is really, I guess, its stronghold. When you come further south, there are a few colonies along the English-Welsh borders, um, one or two still hanging on in, uh, in, in southern England, in places like Sussex, Surrey, Hampshire, and then a significant population still hanging on in, uh, in Devon, especially around the, uh, the edges of Dartmoor. But um, its distribution is, is a shadow of what it used to be. It used to be a relatively common butterfly found throughout woodlands in the UK. Um, and not that long ago, I say right up to the 50s and 60s, it was relatively widespread. So we mentioned some of these factors already, but clearly climate is crucial. The microclimate uh, is often overlooked, but at ground level, temperatures can be very different. This is one reason why the pearls like a freshly coppiced coop, because uh, there'll be a lot of bare ground, there'll be a lot of twigs, uh, leaf litter, dead leaves, um, and that type of surface really heats up once the sun gets going. If you have a temperature gun, you can get these, these little ray guns quite cheaply, um, pointed at the surface of that type of habitat, and you can register at least 10 or even 15 degrees above the, the general ambient air temperature. So the caterpillars, of course, are down at ground level, and they're benefiting from that. So they, they particularly like young violet. They will feed on, on the violet uh, in the springtime, put on a lot of weight very quickly. They, they eat a lot over a relatively short space of time. To get through that, to digest that, uh, they need warmth. And so that's why even up in Northwest Scotland, they're happy to be there because again, the microclimate is giving them that warmth that they need. So that's one reason why they are so particular and so fussy. Um, obviously the host plants need to be uh, in good condition. There needs to be a lot of it. You need to have suitable overwintering conditions for eggs. Um, so being a, a rare butterfly, it's, it's rare for a reason. And it's I guess it's because it's probably too fussy for its own good. And if it hasn't got the right habitat, I'm afraid it won't, it won't survive. The one place where it has survived, thank goodness, is uh, on Wharton Crag. But again, you can see the numbers have gone down, especially from the 90s. Um, this is uh, the southern southwest facing slope of Wharton Crag, which does catch a lot of sun, being a southwesterly aspect. You'll see um, it's managed. The vegetation is kept fairly short to give it that lovely warm microclimate. And there's uh, a pearl bordered feeding on a dandelion. Again, dandelions are quite, are quite a good early nectar source at that time of year, because it is one of our early emergers. They're the, the violets that, of course, they're looking for. The caterpillars will say only feed on dog violet, whereas small pearls will actually feed on other types of violet. Uh, a lot of students from Lancaster University have done some brilliant research especially on Wharton Crag, looking at pearls and small pearl bordered pertilleras. One way of monitoring them is to do this uh, capture, mark and release um, work. So this actually doesn't, doesn't harm the butterfly. A little felt pen mark in the right part of the wing through the net, um, leaving spots on the wings. If you put the spots in the right place and you've got a key and you know what you're doing, then these are identification marks unique to that butterfly. When it's recaptured, they will know exactly which number it is, and they'll be able to work out how far it's traveled, um, how long it's lived, uh, whether it's um, moving from one colony to the next and so on. So you can actually get a lot of information from that. So, that uh, just indicates a little bit more about the, uh, the marking system there that's used for this sort of type of research. Um, in 2009, 
there were still five colonies of pearl bordered uh, on Wharton Crag. Prior to that, there had been more, but we were down to, uh, to five at that point. You'll see that just a few years later, 2016, uh, only three colonies uh, remained. And in fact, the two smaller colonies, you can see indicated by the size there, uh, have now gone with only the larger colony, the one further south, uh, nearer to the road, uh, still actually uh, there. So certainly pearl borders have had a difficult time on Wharton Crag. That's the sort of environment they need. They used to be quite common on Yelland Hall allotments, but again, the same thing has happened, I'm afraid. Numbers have uh, gone down a lot over the last 20 years. Uh, and in fact, uh, over the last two or three years, uh, pearl borders have not been seen on Yelland Hall allotments. Small pearls we mentioned were doing a little better. You can see straight away that this one has more pearls rather than that one very prominent pearl in the center of the hind wing. The distribution map shows them much, much more widely distributed, although still largely absent from the south and east of the country. Uh, again, they used to be widespread right across the country, but uh, have become more westerly. Um, holding up reasonably well in terms of numbers. You see there've been some good years and bad years as they are with pretty much all these species, but the overall trend is reasonably positive for the small pearl. And it's because it is less niche, less particular. Now, in terms of identification, they really do look very, very similar to the pearl. Uh, you'd think the small pearl is smaller. Well, yes, it is, but so, minimal the, dis the difference between them that really I wouldn't recommend using that uh, as a tool. Uh, look for the 730 you can see indicated in the top left when the wings are open and when the wings are shut as mentioned you'll see there are many 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 more pearls you've still got the seven along the edge but you've got quite a collection there uh, and you'll also notice that there is this very prominent cell that's orange with a quite a big black eye in the center now both species have that but it, it's much more prominent on the small pearl the black eye is actually much bigger as you can see from this picture there again a, a nice picture of um, a small pearl with its wings closed on cross-leaved heather which indicates, which grows in damper environments. And again, that indicates that this is a species that will tolerate damper environments. There again, with its wings open. Now, I, I particularly um, use not just the 730, which you can see there, but also if you look around the edges of the wings, you've got this lattice pattern. It's almost like a figure of eight all the way down the wings right the way around and on the small pearl you can see that pretty much it's it's continuous with a fairly continuous figure of eight whereas on the uh, on the pearl the inner part of the figure of eight is often detached from the outer part looking more like a series of chevrons that are slightly detached from the edge of the butterfly this shows the figure of eight very, very clearly. Um, it's a female. Females have a slightly darker figure of eight around the edge. Um, you'll see a slightly fatter abdomen, of course, because that can be another useful way of telling them apart, that the females are often full of eggs um, and their abdomens can be quite swollen, especially if they haven't yet laid uh, eggs. But this one, the um, it's slightly less orange, but, but slightly blacker, and that's typical of a, of a female. Again, um, a marking scheme uh, on Wharton Crag with student research. There is a student there demonstrating to a group of us um, how, how she went about marking and did, and did her cap captive uh, release uh, research. Now, the, the research is really all part of what we call uh, 
solution testing on this graph, if I can just be theoretical for a second, uh, with, with rarer butterflies, obviously we're concerned. So we have to assess their status and that's best done by recording and recording techniques will tell you what the population is and hopefully you can establish how many colonies, how big the colonies are, whether the colonies are relatively stable. Uh, diagnosis will include looking at the habitat, looking at uh, what the prospects are for the butterfly on that site, trying to diagnose what the issues are, what the problems are. Um, and then hopefully once you've done that, you'll be able to come up with some uh, ideas on how they can be recovered, um, solution testing. Uh, and this involves uh, research, but it also involves perhaps uh, some management to see which types of management would best work. Now, clearly you're hoping that um, if this is successful, you'll be able to institute a uh, recovery management, a type of management that really does seem to be making a difference. And that's when you'll notice the population is significantly increasing on the graph. And what you hope to achieve, of course, is that um, after a while, it'll be uh, sustainable management, i.e. populations will be stabilized, there'll be less of a threat of collapse, and hopefully less intervention, because clearly if, if a population needs constant intervention, uh, we, we simply don't have the resources. Cumbria Wildlife Trust, working with butterfly conservation, with all the other conservation charities and bodies, with all the volunteers, uh, and all the uh, resources that we have, we wouldn't be able to manage all the sites for these rare butterflies. So it is very important that we do try to come up with the right type of management and then hope that that can be done sustainably. One way, of course, you can manage more sustainably is to work with landowners um, and land managers to, to get them on board. And ideally, you'd want uh, those people then to, to manage their land in a way that is beneficial to them and that they're happy with, but will also benefit the butterflies. And that's when you, you have this so-called sort of win-win situation where things really are looking much more positive. Moving on to the larger fritillaries, the, the high brown is our rarest UK butterfly. Very, very similar to the uh, dark green butterfly that tends to fly in similar locations and pretty much at the same time. But the high brown does have some distinctive features, such as the, the rusty rings that are labelled on the left and the uh, concave margin to its forewing, which gives the uh, forewing a, a much more pointed appearance. On the dark green, the rusty rings are absent. And if anything, the concave margin is actually not concave at all. It's much straighter and in many cases um, convex. Uh, so those are two key differences which help distinguish those two. But just focusing on the high brown, I say it is our rarest UK butterfly and uh, Cumbria and in particular the Morecambe Bay area is actually the UK stronghold, the national stronghold for this butterfly. Out of 30 colonies in the UK, um, 20 of them are actually in Cumbria. Uh, so we're very fortunate in, in having this wonderful butterfly here. Again, it used to be quite widespread, but you can see from the uh, graph and the and the table on the map that its population is now very restricted. In fact, this is out of date. The uh, the red dots along the Welsh border in the Malvern Hills have actually all now gone. So we've got the uh, the Morecambe Bay populations. You can see there's just one red dot left in South Wales, Allen Bay, Allen Valley. And then in uh, Cornwall, uh, the edge of Dartmoor, and in North, uh, sorry, uh, edge of Devon, uh, uh, Devon, the edge of Dartmoor, and in North uh, da uh, Devon, we've got colonies near the coast uh, and just across the border in Cornwall. But that's it. That, I'm afraid that is the total national distribution. You can see down by 69%. In fact, some more recent surveys show its population has fallen by. 75 or even 80 percent since the 1970s. Um, quite a worry as you can see, although again in Cumbria the last couple of years it looks as if it's stabilized at a very very low level. 
So there you can just see the, um, the straight or even slightly convex forewing. Um, another feature I'd point out is you can see, if you look at the forewings, you've got two large blobs uh, and then a, a much smaller dot, and then three large blobs. Well, again, on the high brown, that third smaller dot is uh, usually much smaller than on, than on a dark green, where the dark green has a, a, you know, a quite a bit bigger third blob down. So that could be another feature uh, if it keeps its wings open. That's actually a slightly more up-to-date map. You can see, I'm afraid, that the Malvern colonies have gone, just the one colony now left in, in South Wales. Beautiful butterfly. Clear rusty rings are the, uh, the main diagnostic feature when it shuts its wings. The rusty rings there stand out very well. Feeding on an orchid, uh, a mating pair, a beautiful fertility. It's a strong, powerful butterfly that can fly quite rapidly, especially the males will fly very rapidly over bracken areas looking for females. On a hot day, they can be almost impossible to photograph because they can shoot about very, very quickly. Another mating pair. Always a delight because when we see mating pairs, we know that eggs are going to be laid. Very different. I put this dark green slide in early just to show you the contrast. If I go back, they're the rusty rings and no rusty rings. But um, I, uh, one thing that isn't quite so clear is that um, high brown can actually have quite a bit of green shading. Here, there's very little on these two specimens, but they can have a fair bit of green shading, but not as much as this. I mean, that, that certainly is a very significant feature, isn't it? Uh, the, the green patch on the underside. These are the main sites uh, where we find um, high brown. Uh, and indeed, most of these sites have uh, dark green fritillary flying there as well. Sadly, you'll see um, some are extinct, um, but we still have quite a number of colonies, although some of them are actually quite small. They stretch from uh, Hutton Roof, the Hutton Roof area, just across the, the M6 motorway, um, through the northern part of Lancashire, around Morecambe Bay, uh, up onto Whitbarrow, Hampsfell, uh, and then again through the Winster Valley, uh, as far as the Rustland Valley. Um, possibly there's still some on Helsington, if you know that site, but that's under threat. So you'll see um, these are the colonies nationwide, and uh, you'll notice that Morecambe Bay has, uh, according to this, 12 small, four medium, one large uh, site, so it has the majority of sites. Um, in fact, these figures are changing all the time. We have found one or two new colonies. Uh, equally, we have lost one or two colonies. And again, their size varies from year to year. Some small colonies can do well and become medium size and vice versa. Um, so uh, on Wharton Crag, Arnside Knot and Holm Park Fell, we, we did some studies of vegetation comparing 2004 with 2016. The main feature here really is that in those 12 years, violet cover decreased by 40% mainly for the reasons we mentioned earlier regarding climate change and excess nitrogen in the atmosphere. Um, and of course, such a big collapse in violet cover over a relatively short space of time is a real worry to both the, the pearl bordered and the high brown. Those two in particular really do uh, rely on, on well-managed sites. They're looking for this sort of habitat to lay their eggs. Lots of um, violet, but also lots of leaf litter, dead bracken, twigs, even patches of bare earth. Um, that sort of warm habitat really helps. Bracken can be very important. One of the great things about bracken is that violets will grow through bracken litter as long as it's not too thick and too wet. Um, so several centimeters of bracken uh, can be actually quite good. What it does is it will suppress 
most other species, including many grasses, but violets will work their way through the bracken. The other great thing about the bracken, of course, is that dead bracken will warm up rapidly and give you this lovely microclimate. Um, just uh, in more detail on, on Whitbarrow, you can see some of the work that we're trying to do to keep these rare fritillaries going. We're doing uh, scrub clearance, we're doing ride management, we're doing coppicing. Sometimes we pay for contractors to coppice. We work obviously uh, closely with other partner organisations. Cumbria Wildlife Trust do some wonderful coppicing I mentioned um, in How Reading Wood. Um, and again, looking at the, the sites in more detail, you can see how there has been a little bit of recolonization, which is very exciting. Um, equally, we have lost sites. So the whole thing is dynamic. You would expect that, but um, we're having to work on, on key sites to try to keep, keep these populations going. Uh, I've gone through that, so I'm going to move on and look at the dark green fritillary. A, a stunningly beautiful fritillary. I think it's often underrated because it's not as rare as the high brown and can get overlooked, but it's a very, very beautiful butterfly. It's one of our larger butterflies, again, a very powerful butterfly and beautifully marked. Uh, and again, it's, um, it, it, it's lost a lot of its former distribution over much of the south and east. Having said that, um, there are still some very significant populations in the south. Um, and it's certainly not rare up in Cumbria. Uh, in fact, there are lots of colonies right across Cumbria, uh, pretty much throughout the county. Um, you'll see it's had good years and bad years. Um, I suppose you could say, well, although numbers are quite low at the moment, um, there were two or three exceptional years and you can't necessarily sustain those sorts of numbers year after year. Um, again, the underside that we looked at before, and um, there we are with its wings uh, open. This is um, the female. You can see it's darker again, as with the, um, the pearl bordered and the small pearl. The dark green uh, female is significantly darker, especially around the edge. More of a contrast, if you like, between the, the dark and the light colouring, whereas the, the male appears to be more gingery uh, with slightly less darker markings. The female is also larger and uh, certainly uh, one of our largest fritillaries, one of our largest butterflies and, and a striking butterfly. I think the female is so different that usually you can pretty much be sure if, if its wings are open uh, that it's not a high brown. Uh, even without close examination, you can see the markings from a distance and it's relatively easy to eliminate female dark greens uh, in terms of is it a high brown or not. Uh, it's, it's much more difficult if it's a male um, dark green because they can look very much like high brown fritillaries. Now here's the, uh, the biggest butterfly apart from the swallowtail. The biggest um, fritillary that we have is actually the 14, the second biggest fritillary out of 50 fritillaries in Europe. And it's the biggest in, out of eight fritillaries that we have in, in the UK. Um, this is a male, uh, particularly orange uh, with darker markings. You can see the, um, the veins in its forewings are picked out by these black lines. And some of those black lines will also release uh, scent. They're called sex brands, and they will release um, pheromone to attract females. They have a particularly elaborate courtship flight with females where they, they, uh, they loop the loop over a female while flying along. They'll, they'll literally loop her in flight repeatedly, um, opening these uh, glands to release pheromones. And then uh, in North Cumbria, we have um, the uh, uh, marsh fritillary, uh, which we almost lost, uh, saved at the last moment. Again, a stunning butterfly, a beautiful butterfly. Um, now these don't feed on violet. Um, 
again a nationally rare butterfly very localized and again much reduced in distribution and in abundance but uh, north cumbria has now once again become a stronghold uh, for this butterfly now they will only lay eggs on devil's bit scabious and devil's bit scabious is is a plant that likes quite damp conditions um, and is particular in its needs so it is quite localized but where you find it, it, it can do very well and can become quite abundant. Um, and then Smardale Gill, that wonderful nature reserve managed by Cumbria Wildlife Trust, um, a fantastic place to see Scotch Argus. Scotch Argus um, are only found in, uh, in Cumbria and in one or two sites in Yorkshire outside Scotland. Scotland is uh, certainly north and west Scotland uh, is the stronghold for this butterfly as you would expect with the name that it has but south of the border to see it you need to go really to Smardale Gill or to Arnside Knot. The Arnside Knot population um, is much reduced, has suffered through climate change, it's become very dry and uh, too hot and the grasses there are not sufficiently lush. This is one of those grass feeders that actually likes longer, cooler, damper, grassy conditions. Um, and Smardale certainly can offer that. So it's actually doing very well at Smardale. And that's a view from Arnside Knot. Many of you I'm sure are familiar with that lovely view across the estuary. So the populations in uh, England have, have fallen but um, at Arnside, not, I'm afraid they've fallen a lot more. A handsome butterfly, especially when it's uh, freshly emerged, it has a, a lovely chocolate velvety color with those lovely uh, reddy markings down the wings. The females are slightly less red, a little bit more pale. There's a, a map showing you the location of, uh, of Smardale Gill. Uh, it's just to uh, many of you know it, of course, and if you haven't been, you really should should go. It's a lovely sight. They're on the wing last week of July and the first two weeks of uh, August, although in the right weather, they'll fly right through August. And here's another national rarity, uh, again, much more common in Scotland, but in the UK, uh, you have to go if you're coming south of the border, uh, you have to come to Cumbria to see our only true mountain species, uh, the mountain ringlet. Um, we have a very interesting site at Erton Fell that we uh, usually have guided walks to uh, in very, very early June because it's a very early site. It's the most accessible site and it's the most uh, westerly site. It's also has the lowest elevation, um, but otherwise they can be found on, on a number of higher elevations right across uh, the central fells from the west to uh, to places like Horswater, um, to Kidsty Pike and High Rays above above Horswater. Um, this is a site. Uh, this is actually um, quite close uh, to Erton Fell. Another national rarity: the northern brown Argus, a lovely freshly emerged northern brown Argus. Um, you can see almost glimmering and shining. When they emerge, they, they tend to sit and dry their wings off from emergence. I've actually only just noticed that this is actually a mating pair. It's so easy to miss the, uh, the other butterfly, isn't it? Um, and it might seem strange to say it's freshly emerged, but mating, but quite often mating will occur very, very soon after emergence. And another speciality for Cumbria, uh, the small blue, our smallest butterfly, um, quite often no bigger than a fingernail. It really is tiny. If you haven't seen one fly, uh, your first sighting will make you think, well, is this really a butterfly? Um, it's the small blue, but it's not particularly blue. This is about as blue as they get. This is the male. Uh, usually they look slightly less blue than this, a little more slaty colored and uh, Certainly the female is, is quite a, a grey slaty colour. 
Uh, then another rare butterfly that we are fortunate in having up in Cumbria is the Duke of Burgundy. Um, it used to be called a fritillary, but we now know it actually belongs to its own family in the UK, although worldwide there are many other members of this family. Um, it lays its eggs exclusively on uh, primrose and cowslip, quite often just one or two eggs. Here we've got quite a batch. It's unusual to perhaps see so many eggs close together, but the female will just curl its abdomen round to the underside of the leaf uh, to lay its eggs. So the caterpillars will only feed uh, on primrose and cowslip. The primrose and cowslip are quite abundant, uh, but um, the, the Duke of Burgundy is fussy, and that's again why it's rare and localized. The, the habitat has to be just right in terms of uh, the right amount of scrub, the right height of uh, grass, the right sort of height of sward, if you like, of the grass. Um, for example, males like to perch on scrubby plants that are perhaps a metre high off the ground to survey their territories. They set up territories and wait for females to, to come into their territory. They will defend their territories against other males arriving by a, a vigorous aerial combat. So all these things are important in, in when you look at the detail. And if the conditions aren't right, if, if the males aren't happy with their territory, if the females aren't happy with the egg laying opportunities, um, if it's too shady or not shady enough, if it's too damp or it's too, too dry, then this can all have a big impact on whether they will thrive or not and whether they will be there or not. And so they are very localized. Uh, where, where they like to be, they can have quite good years. But again, their numbers can fluctuate from year to year. It's certainly a butterfly that um, we're delighted is here and we're doing all we can to help manage for it to keep it here. There's a close up of a single egg. So they often are laid singly in this way. Um, you'll see overall numbers are down, although in the south of England, over the last few years, um, numbers have picked up a little bit. So the national picture for the Duke of Burgundy is actually a little bit more positive now. Uh, the food plant you'll see is widespread. So these are distribution maps, not of the butterfly, but of the food plant. So um, here it is feeding on bugle. Again, you'll see a spring plant, a spring butterfly. They emerge usually uh, in May, early May, occasionally in late April. Certainly in the south, they'll emerge a little bit late, a little bit earlier. But up here, it's usually end of uh, end of April, beginning of May. Their main flight season is is through the month of May. By the time we get to June, there are very few left. There's the distribution. You can see in the bottom left picture. You'll notice there are one or two populations over in the North Yorkshire Moors. Um, I think some were released in Lincolnshire. But otherwise, uh, really, Morecambe Bay is a little island uh, of populations um, a long way away from the stronghold areas, which are in the, the South Midlands and the South Centre of the country. Um, there used to be many, many more populations. Uh, Matthew Oates and others have done studies to show that in the uh, 1990s, Morecambe Bay had uh, well over 30 colonies. Uh, sadly, now uh, only a handful remain. Um, certainly, the early two, well, the late 1990s and the early 2000s, uh, the populations became more isolated from each other, more fragmented. I think the habitats were degraded, and uh, a lot of these populations were lost. Uh, we're working closely with um, Cumbria University at the moment uh, to try to to help reverse the downward trend. There is a heritage lottery funded project that's being managed by Cumbria University in particular um, that's going to, to do its best to, to stabilize populations and hopefully turn their fortunes around. So these are some of the um, earlier sites. You'll see um, lots and lots of little localized populations. If we go back in time, you'll see Morecambe Bay in the center. That's the Kent estuary. And you'll see um, North Lancashire, your Arnside Knot, where they used to be found, for example. Gate Barrow used to be a stronghold. Well, they're just about hanging on there, but uh, with difficulty. 
and there were even populations on Hutton Roof, the other side of the motorway that I mentioned before, one or two other populations, and quite a few in the Winster Valley and also uh, up on Whitbarrow. So these are the sort of populations that uh, we used to have. Sadly, we've lost a lot of those. This is just looking in a little bit more detail at some populations to the uh, to the west of Windermere, where that they are still uh, a number of of small populations there. So that's what the the uh, females are looking for: some nice, healthy primrose or cowslip plants. Here's some plug planting. We've done plug planting. We've um, also been trialing uh, the planting of scattering of seed, uh, different measures to, to see if we can boost the, uh, the number of food plants, because that's certainly one way of, of helping the Duke of Burgundy. And uh, here we have some feeding damage where you can see um, the caterpillars have been at work. Again, the distribution of, of sites that we looked at earlier, there's a, a caterpillar I can see, um, responsible no doubt for some feeding damage there. Um, and again, numbers down, but stabilizing. So um, we, we hope that uh, we can continue to at least uh, stabilize the populations and maybe even turn them around a little bit. The, the Northern Brown Argus is very, very similar to uh, the brown argus, which is much more widespread um, further south, but up in uh, Cumbria, North Lancashire and Cumbria, um, we we only have the uh, northern brown. Um, the key difference in appearance, really, is that I think they look a little smaller, but um, the textbooks will say look for the four wings, and in particular look for a dot. Uh, in the center of each forewing. On the left, you can see a little black dot. On the right, a more obvious uh, white dot. Uh, we have both forms in, in, uh, in Cumbria, um, some with black dots, some with uh, white dots. Uh, we only have a, a single brood. Northern Brown only uh, produce a single brood of butterflies. They emerge usually um, in May. Uh, a latter barrow is, has been recently a very good site for early emergence. Uh, if you don't know latter barrow, another wonderful Cumbria Wildlife Trust reserve um, just off the A590, the main road uh, towards Barrow from the motorway. Um, and very close, in fact, to Foulshore and Meathop Moss. But um, there they um, they lay their eggs on rock rows. On all these sites, in fact, they they lay their eggs singly on, on the upper surface of rock rows. You can see a little white marking on the rock rows in the bottom left. Uh, many eggs are laid underneath leaves, whereas the northern brown actually lay their eggs on top of leaves. So you can actually find the eggs. They do stand out, even though they're tiny. You can see these little white eggs if you look for them uh, in, in late May. They're on the wing uh, into June, and in cooler, damper areas or slightly higher elevated areas they will fly uh, right into July and even even early August again uh, a close-up showing you that mating uh, couple which uh, I hadn't actually noticed earlier on um, and uh, here we have some uh, some common blues which are much more common and some different types of, uh, of blue. But uh, I put the, the common blues up here to really show you the difference between the common blues and uh, the northern brown. Because although common blues, the females are often mentioned in the textbooks as, as being largely brown, they can actually have quite a bit of, uh, of blue scaling, especially nearer the body. So if you look in the bottom left, you can see the, uh, the female common blue with quite a bit of uh, brown, but it does have quite a bit of blue scaling. Um, whereas the uh, the northern brown have very, very little blue scaling at all. They're much, much darker. Both the male and the female uh, are pretty much uh, a chocolatey brown throughout. And when they shut their wings, again, you can see on the right-hand side, 
at the top. The top one is a common blue with, uh, with that black dot indicated by the arrow. Whereas if you look in the bottom right, you'll see that uh, dot is missing in the northern brown Argus. The general appearance is one of fewer black dots on the outside. So if you can only see the wing shut. Another big difference, of course, is that the northern brown really is a very, very small butterfly. Um, I would say it's our second smallest after the, uh, the small blue. And they can appear as, as in flight as very, very small silvery colored butterflies. And really, you, you must have rock crows somewhere close by to support a colony of, uh, of northern brown Argus. But it's a beautiful little butterfly. Um, and surprisingly can be found in woodland glades, as well as in more open areas, such as Wharton Crag. And going back to the small blue, we looked at it briefly earlier, but um, we've been uh, doing a lot of work on the small blue, on, especially on brownfield sites uh, up in northwest Cumbria, especially in the Workington Whitehaven area. Um, here's one with its wings shut. Um, the, uh, the wall brown has also become much more coastal and much rarer over the years. Its numbers of its distribution and its abundance have fallen quite significantly. But in Cumbria, we're lucky to still have reasonable populations pretty much all along the coast. And in some inland areas, especially um, higher up, if you're walking um, low hills, but with some elevation, and if the hilltops become a little rocky in places, it's not uncommon to find a, a small colony of uh, wall brown flitting around the rocky areas uh, at the tops of these hills, um, as well as, of course, uh, in, in coastal areas and, and indeed in some quarries. They're quite well named, the, the wall bit. Um, they certainly do like sitting on, on stone walls. Now here, it's quite unusual to see them basking with their wings open. Usually they will actually land and sit with their wings shut. And quite often that's the view you get if you want to photograph them. It's, it's not impossible, but quite difficult to get a good photograph of one with its wings open. Um, here's the large heath, which is also a, a national rarity and certainly very localized and, and absent from much of the country. Um, they love raised mires, raised bogs, and they're very happy in places like Foulshaw and Methot, where there's plenty of cotton grass for their caterpillars to feed, and where the adults will nectar on cross-leaved heather. Um, so they're quite good populations there, although their populations have diminished over the last 20, 30 years. Um, and again, good populations on the northern mosses. I think I mentioned earlier, mosses like Lassen, Drumbra and Wedham Flow. The ones with the bigger eyes tend to be further south in, on the southern mosses, and the ones uh, on the northern mosses have smaller eye spots. Uh, dingy skippers, again, are very localized um, and possibly under recorded, um, and uh, are doing quite well in Cumbria. We have quite a lot of colonies, especially on the limestones where the turf is shorter. They do like fairly short turf. They also quite like brownfield sites as well. Um, they like to bask where there's plenty of bare earth and uh, where they can pick up quite a bit of warmth from below. You can see they're quite well camouflaged for those situations as well. Um, another hair streak, the purple hair streak, uh, far from keeping low, this keeps high, tends to prefer to fly around the tops of uh, oak trees. Occasionally they'll come down to nectar. But um, these are seriously under recorded, and I suspect they're doing quite well in Cumbria. Uh, they are found right across Cumbria, but not in higher, more elevated areas. Uh, so we are talking about woodlands where there are a good number of oaks in particular, although they will fly from oaks to adjacent trees and back again. Um, people often say a good time to see them is to go to where there are oak trees and where you can get a good view without straining your neck too much. Perhaps if you're slightly elevated and looking slightly down on an oak tree would be particularly helpful. Um, late in the afternoon or even early evening, 
<clears throat> mainly um, late on in the year. So we're talking about more July into August rather than uh, rather than earlier. It's one of our later emerging butterflies. But because they're arboreal and they often like to feed on aphid honeydew, um, they're not often seen at ground level. And again, they don't often open their wings when they do come down, but occasionally. There we are with its wings shut. People often say they look like silver pennies uh, flitting around above the tops of oak trees. If it's not too windy, um, late in the day on a sunny July or early August day. We're taking some binoculars, going to have a look at a suitable site and see. And I suspect that there are many, many more sites that we don't know about. The occasional one will open its wings. The, the males are the showing off ones with the lovely color, coloring uh, there. The females are much more subdued. White letter hair streak is another that's under recorded. We, we weren't even sure they were resident in Cumbria until relatively recently, but uh, now we're finding colonies on Witch Elm. Sadly, we've lost, as you know, most of our um, old English elm, but there's quite a lot of Witch Elm. A surprising amount has survived, and uh, there the caterpillars will only feed on Witch Elm. And again, they'll fly in the tops of Witch Elm. They will occasionally come down, as you can see, top left, it looks like it's on ragwort. But um, bottom right is the usual picture with people with binoculars looking at the tops of Witch Elm. And there's a close up with a white letter. So it's quite a good name, the white letter hair streak, a streak of white with a W shape. And uh, unfortunately, we're not able to show this uh, film. But uh, they are, if you if you look up on uh, on um, YouTube, they are some films of some of these butterflies that you can watch. The brown hair streak uh, is a butterfly that used to be relatively abundant in uh, North Lancashire and in the Arnside area. Um, became extinct in probably the 1930s or 40s. Um, through lack of uh, good habitat. It will only lay its eggs on blackthorn. There still is quite a bit of blackthorn in, uh, in Arnside and Silverdale and the Gate Barrows area, those sorts of areas in North Lancs and just across the border into Cumbria. And uh, they reappeared um, 15 years ago or so. We suspect that they were probably released there because the nearest colony is actually in Worcestershire. And there's no way they could have got from Worcestershire to this area by themselves. But they've been there now for a number of years in, in relatively low numbers. But again, it's a very late emerging butterfly, a very elusive butterfly, and another arboreal species that likes to fly at the tops of trees. Um, but it will come down. And uh, occasionally, you can see it nectaring on uh, on knapweed and other nectar sources um, at waist height and so on. But you'll see it lay its eggs um, at the joints of uh, blackthorn where young growth is coming out of older growth. Uh, the caterpillars will, will feed exclusively on the blackthorn uh, and then they emerge in July and fly right into, into August, occasionally into early September if the weather is uh, suitable. So there we have the different stages of the uh, brown hair streak, uh, perhaps our most recent addition to the, the 40 species that live in Cumbria, and certainly a very rare butterfly, and one that uh, is really, um, its stronghold is down in the South Midlands. One or two more photos there with, um, it's a very beautiful butterfly as you can see. So uh, really, I just want to finish the uh, the talk now with um, reference to some little thumbnail sketches. I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, what I have produced with a friend, actually, Steve Doyle, who's been uh, very helpful in supplying much of the detail for this, some little summaries of uh, what we've been saying about each of these rarer species, like the wall brown, you see the marsh fritillary, the, the fritillaries there, what we looked at, the northern brown argus, 
uh, the purple and the white letter hair streak and the brown hair streak and so on. They wanted to commoner ones mixed in with this. I didn't want to edit those out, overcomplicate matters, but I have concentrated more on the rarer species that we've been looking at, like the Scotch Argus, uh, the large heath, and so on. Um, we do occasionally have migrants, like the yellow, the clouded yellow. The marbled white isn't a migrant and has been released, but I, I'm not aware of any colonies in existence in Cumbria at the moment. But certainly the clouded yellow will come from time to time. I guess every two or three years, people see clouded yellows, sometimes in reasonable numbers, usually along the coast, because they migrate up from the south and often follow a coastline. So I've heard reports, for example, someone's seen one perhaps on the Lancashire coast. The next time they're one or two turning up perhaps at Arnside, someone's seen one at Grange and then so on. It moving up the coast, reports from St. Bees Head and working to Whitehaven. So they, they do tend to do that, but perhaps every two or three years. Um, they're more likely to be spotted in the south of the, of the UK, but uh, these are migrants that come from the continent. Very, very rarely um, other migrants turn up, such as the Camwell Beauty. Uh, a friend of mine has seen one in Cumbria on two separate occasions. I certainly haven't. I would love to see one, but uh, that's an extreme rarity for, for Cumbria. Anyway, um, if you'd like a little summary of that, uh, send me your email or send uh, a message to Lucy, and uh, I'm sure one of us can supply you with a, a little summary. But um, really, I'm going to pause there. Um, I know it's been a lot of detail, and I apologize for the, the length and the amount of detail I've covered, but I would be very, very happy to answer uh, questions uh, from anybody. So by all means, if you have questions, I think Lucy hopefully has one or two questions already that you can yeah. uh, pass to me. Um, if anyone's got any questions, just pop them in the chat bar. So if you look on the right hand corner um, and if you'd like a summary, email me at Lucy B at Cumbria Wildlife. I'm just typing it out now for the chat trust org.uk so it's lucy g at cumbria wildlife trust.org.uk i've just put it in the chat bar if you'd like to give me an email then we can get those summaries sent out to you um but if anyone has any questions please put it in the chat bar while you're thinking of possible questions uh, i'm just going to hold up this i don't know whether you can uh, see it can, can that can that is that visible if you go um, back a bit, Chris, you might be able to see it. It's a it's an ID um, chart produced by uh, the what the um, yeah the, the Field Studies Council. They they produce a whole range of wonderful laminated uh, ID charts that are great for taking out into the field. Um, I'm also going to mention one or two other references. I think people often ask me what what are the best books. Uh, to to buy to help them with identification of butterflies and in particular rare butterflies um, I, I think the the book written by Jeremy Thomas and illustrated by Richard uh, Lewington is is the best the early edition if you can see it uh, looked like this and is uh, is now out of print um, but it's just called the butterflies of Britain and Ireland by Thomas and Lewington um, the early edition, as I say, uh, you can get second hands usually for around about £10, um, which is a great buy. It's a fantastic book. Um, the newer editions, the, the two new editions out now, um, I'm afraid they, they tend to be quite expensive, but are still really excellent books. You'd be talking about £25, maybe £35 for the latest edition. But it's a wonderful reference copy to have at home. Again, if you can see this, um, that's the the newer edition of Butterflies, uh, the Butterflies of Britain and Ireland by Thomas and Lewington. Um, there are other books that are better suited for taking out into the field. This one's just called um, Britain's Butterflies by um, Newland and Still, and that's produced by Wild Guides, and that's a photographic summary 
of uh, all the species you're likely to see in, in the UK and in Cumbria. And it gives photos of males and females. It gives photos of eggs, caterpillars, the food plant, the, the larva, and so on. Distribution maps. It's, it's an excellent little guide with a, a plastic cover that you can take out with you. And there are also a range of DVDs. I won't go through all of them, but um, this one I particularly like. Uh, Patrick Barkham, you might have heard of him. He's written quite a few natural history books. He writes for the Guardian newspaper. And uh, this one's Patrick Barkham's Guide to British Butterflies. And uh, it's a double, a double DVD that covers all, all the UK species. Lucy, any any uh, questions? No questions today. It doesn't no seem questions. like anyone. But uh, a massive thank you for doing this, this talk and also the last talk, Chris. They've been really enjoyable. It doesn't no seem that like we've got. It doesn't seem like we've got any questions though. Um, Perhaps I could just finish then, if if there aren't any questions, by saying that um, I'm sure most people are members of uh, Cumbria Wildlife Trust. Uh, a lot of their nature reserves are wonderful for butterflies. A lot of them are managed specially for butterflies, in fact. Um, and uh, also, uh, if you're not a member, please please do join. Um, and also, you might like to consider joining Cumbria Butterfly Conservation. Um, we produce newsletters, and we also run all sorts of events, including guided walks in the summer and work party conservation activities uh, in the winter months. Of course, that's all been a bit um, hit by coronavirus this year, but uh, we hope to be getting back to normal. Um, if you'd like to find out more about us, uh, please go on our website. If you just Google Cumbria Butterfly Conservation, and then go through all the, uh, the links there, and you'll see links to some of our previous editions of our magazine, and that'll give you a very good idea of what we're all about and what we do, and the latest, issue of that is out now it's sort of hot off the press so um you know an invitation to everybody to to have a look at that can i just add um i've added a feedback form in the chat bar if anyone has time it only takes five minutes to fill out and it helps us do more of these workshops so thank you i'll just put it in the chat bar right well, I don't think there's any questions, Chris. No? OK. Must you have covered, covered everything. everything. Yes. You must have covered everything. <laughs> OK. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you to everyone for attending. Many people are saying that the talk is excellent, so thank you again, Chris. No pleasure. Yeah. Thanks very much for coming and joining us. Thank you. OK, bye, everyone. Bye, thank Chris. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. That was great. Last time I I said several times through the talk, don't forget questions, don't yeah. forget questions, you know, questions at the end. Yeah. I kept reminding. Yeah. This time I forgot to do that. And then when I ended and said any questions, silence, yeah. you know, no questions. It can be long on home. Because last time there were loads of questions. Yeah. There's some good questions, actually. Yeah. Some really yeah. good questions. Yeah. I don't know if, if, if you are, Lucy can tell how many people still were in attendance at the end. If someone dropped out and switched it off. Yeah. Well, people wouldn't have just walked. If, if 60 signed up, you'd get about 30. Yeah. Uh, I think last time there were a few more, <clears throat> but then the... was sixty a maximum? No, I don't, think, system so. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, uh, oh excellent. That went very well. I'm I'm just so pleased that there were no technical issues. Yeah, it was just a tiny bit when you could hear some. There was yes. I don't know. What just for a few was, minutes, the sound good, went a bit. Weird. Yeah. And then it seemed to uh, yeah. be okay again. And it, I carried on and tried to ignore it because I thought, well, maybe it's only me that's hearing this weird, yeah. weird sound. Um, 
So I presume I just shut everything down now. Yeah. End meeting for all. I better do that now. Yeah. End meeting for everyone. Mm. Yes.